Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's great to have everyone with us, whether in the house or online. And uh, we've got a lot of folks online. And we keep saying that it's great to have folks check in and to write greetings online, even if you're in here, and then also to send in prayer requests. And indeed, we are socially distant, but hopefully spiritually connected as we worship in-house and online. Just one announcement this morning. We had a great sports camp this past week. So my thanks to Paul House, our head coach, and Terry Seeger, director of youth ministry. And it was just great. Terry is going to share a little bit more about that in a bit. But uh, I think it was really a blessing. The kids were really excited about getting out there. And uh, there's other things that are going on. We have a mom's group that's taking place. But right now, we want to turn our hearts and minds to worship this morning. And all of us have a lot that's uh, weighing on us, I suppose, as well as many things to give thanks for. So let's just allow God's Spirit to touch us in worship this morning. And our call to worship is from Psalm 25, verses 4 through 7. And I would just say this is something new. If you are online, then we have the notes for the traditional service, including the call to worship and the lyrics for the hymns under our website under Sundays at IUCC uh, Worship Notes. So you can go there for those as well. Join me in the call to worship. Show me your ways, O Lord. Guide me in your truth and teach me. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love. Are we on a different one? All right, I'm going to get over here then. Lead me in your truth, for you are the God of my salvation. God is good all the time. Praise the Lord. We invite you to stand and join the worship and music.
Good morning. So we had a great three-day sports camp. Um, the first day we did track and field. So the kids did a lot of running and jumping and shot put and javelin. The second day we did basketball and baseball and we had some pretty good players out there. And the last day we did the playground games, which was four square kickball, Paul's famous limbo, and of course water games, which was the favorite. We had a great turnout and everyone had a good time. We ended Friday night, um, they all got medals with their name on them and they all got little photo keepsakes to take home. We had a family picnic and everyone had a really good time. My thanks to Paul and everyone who helped make it a great success. Um, so in honor and sports camp, I want to talk about Christian athletes and how we can compete for Christ. Last week, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit, and I think this goes right along with it. And this is some things I found from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. It's the competitor's creed. Are you ready to compete for Christ? As a competitor, athlete, coach, or fan, you are a skilled person. You have talents and abilities. You have expectations and deliver results. But as a Christian athlete, being skilled is just in the beginning. A Christian competitor aims to be like Jesus Christ, the greatest competitor of all times. He is the greatest competitor for our souls of men, the greatest champion to hang on the cross, the greatest teammate to lift those up around him, the greatest captain to build a lasting team. If you want to play like Christ every time you put on your uniform, lace up your shoes, or walk out of the locker room, then you are ready to sign the competitor's creed. This creed is for the team of Christians who want to love, who want their love for sports to become evident of their love for Christ. Are you ready? I am a Christian first and last. I am created in the likeness of God Almighty to bring him glory. I am a member of Team Jesus Christ. I wear the colors of the cross. I am a competitor now and forever. I am made to strive, to strain, to stretch, and to succeed in the arena of competition. I am a Christian competitor as much as I face my challengers with the face of Jesus Christ. I do not trust in myself. I do not boast in my abilities or believe in my own strength. I solely rely on the power of God. I compete for the pleasure of my Heavenly Father in the honor of Christ and the reputation of the Holy Spirit. My attitude on and off the field is above reproach. My conduct beyond criticism. Whether I am preparing, practicing, or playing, I submit to God's authority. And those he, he has put over me, I respect my coaches, officials, teammates, competitors, out of respect for the Lord. My body is a temple of Jesus Christ. I protect it from within and without. Nothing enters my body that does not honor the living God. My sweat is an offering to my master. My soreness is a sacrifice to my savior. I give my all, all of the time. I do not give up. I do not give in. I do not give out. I am the Lord's warrior, a competitor by conviction and a disciple of determination. I am confident beyond reason because my confidence lies in Christ. The result of my efforts must result in his glory. Let the competition begin. Let the glory be God's. Let us pray. Dear Lord, please instill this on all of our young athletes, whether they're competing in sports or just competing in life every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Terry and Steve and everyone making worship possible this morning. This morning we continue our series on Turning Point, and this morning we're looking at Stairway to Heaven. We are in the story of Jacob, who is on the run, and we are in Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 through 5 and 10 through 22. 
Uh, we are going to pick it up in verse 5, but just to sort of set a little bit of the landscape here, Jacob and Esau have had a huge conflict, and Jacob is sending, uh, rather Isaac is sending Jacob off to his uncle's place to get out of town and away, uh, away from Esau, and uh, so we pick up the reading there. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Padam. Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel the Arminian, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and the Lord said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised." When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I will take me this food and give me clothes to wear so that I may return to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. The Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, as I said this morning, we're looking at Stairway to Heaven. I love the story of this little boy who was out playing in his front yard, and this man came walking along the road and seemed rather frustrated, and he walked up to the boy and said, excuse, excuse me, son, I'm lost. Can you tell me how to get to the post office? And the little boy said, sure, just go down to the corner stop sign, turn left, go down to the next corner, and it's on your right. And the man said, well, thank you. He said, by the way, I'm the new pastor in town, and if you come to church on Sunday, I'll tell you how to get to, to heaven. The little boy thought for a moment, he said, no thanks, you don't even know how to get to the post office. <laughs> Have you ever felt lost in life? Have you ever lost your way along the journey? And maybe you've even been like Jacob, where you feel like you're at wit's end, and you feel like you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Well, if you have been in that chapter, or even in that chapter now, then I think there's some great spiritual lessons in this story this morning, and so I invite you to walk back into the story. And so the backdrop of this story is this, that uh, Isaac and Rebekah, of course, one of the great love stories in all the Bible, had twins, and they were Jacob and Esau, became their names, but uh, the story is told that they were struggling with each other even in the womb, you know? Sometimes siblings don't get along, and, and so it was even in the womb, and then the prophecy is given that, you know, the greatest would go to uh, the uh, eldest, but in this case it would be the younger, but they were struggling, and it turns out that Esau was the firstborn, and Jacob was born after. Now, Jacob struggled all along. Have you known people to just struggle with themselves and God's will in their life, and so... Uh, at that time, the eldest got the lion's share of the inheritance, so Jacob always wanted that. And so we're told that uh, these two couldn't have been more different. There was uh, Esau, who we're told was sort of the dark, swarthy, hairy one who liked to go hunting, sort of the Ducks Dynasty guy. And then there was Jacob, who was the fairer complected, and he enjoyed gardening and cooking, and uh, he was sort of the emeril type. As it turned out, Isaac took a liking to Esau and Rebekah to Jacob. You know, it's never good when parents sort of uh, pick their favorites, right? In this case, it was all the worst. 
Well, we're told that one day that Esau came in from the woods from hunting. He was famished, and Jacob was cooking this incredible stew. And Esau said, listen, I'll give you anything for a bowl of that stew. And Jacob, the sort of manipulator at this moment, uh, said, sure, I will give you a cup of this stew for your inheritance of the oldest son. Well, foolishly, Esau said, sure, and Jacob gave him the stew and got the uh, inheritance by agreement. And, of course, there was bitterness between the two after that. Well, then uh, Isaac is now up in years, and he wants to give a special blessing to Esau, who got cheated out of this blessing. And so he tells him to go out into the woods and to find this special game that's his favorite and to bring it, and Rebekah would prepare it for him, and then he, after eating, would give this blessing. And so Esau goes out to the woods. Meanwhile, Rebecca has been listening by the side of the tent, and here's this conversation, wants that blessing to go to her favorite son, which happens to be Jacob. So she tells Jacob, listen, go uh, kill a goat, and I'll prepare it in a special way with special seasonings that'll make it taste like wild game. I don't know if it's venison or what it was, but in any case, uh, Jacob says, sure, and she says, then uh, your father will give you the blessing. Now, at this time, uh, Jacob, we believe, was next to blind. And so Jacob says, sure, he can't see very well, but my brother's voice is deep and husky, and he's really hairy. He's going to touch my arms and know that I'm not him. And Rebecca says, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some hair of that goat on your arms. I don't know if she's going to Velcro it or glue it or what, and then speak in a deep voice, right? And, and he'll, he won't know. So Jacob says, okay. And so he takes in this uh, meal to his father, and uh, uh, his father eats the, the meal and then blesses Jacob. And no sooner has Isaac blessed Jacob when Esau comes in from the field and realizes what had happened, and this incredible uh, enmity broke out between the two. Isaac sees what's about to happen, and so he tells Jacob he needs to flee, and he tells him he needs to go to this distant land, to the home of his uncle, and to find a a bride there, which, you know, uh, that was part of the mission. The other part was just to get out of town, because Esau's going to come after him. And so he gives him a blessing, and Jacob heads out, and we're told that Jacob basically had nothing, nothing on his back. So he's manipulated, he's done all these things to get the lion's share of the inheritance, the best blessing from his father, but he leaves home with just the shirt on his back. And isn't it true in our life, too, sometimes we try to manipulate and manipulate rather than sort of going and doing what we're supposed to, and uh, we end up, things don't go as planned. And so it is with Jacob. And so we're told that at the end of that first long day, uh, that all that Jacob could do, he was tired, famished, just had to close his back, was he took a stone and he laid his head on that and used that stone as a pillow. He was literally between a rock and a hard place. You ever been between a rock and a hard place, right? So in the back is uh, Esau, who wants his life, and before him is a land that he doesn't know. And right there on the journey of life, he lays his head on this rock, and he's literally between a rock and a hard place. And I think all of us in some sense are maybe there this morning as we're in the middle of this pandemic, numbers seem to be rising. Uh, But we may also find some twists and turns in our life. Uh, We may be facing an illness, the loss of a loved one, some financial difficulties or relationship difficulties. And the avenues that we seem to try to work things out only make things worse. And so we too sometimes can be between a rock and a hard place. Well, the most amazing thing happens to Jacob. One of the great uh, visions in all the Scripture is that in the middle of the night, Jacob has this vision, this dream of a ladder that goes from his pillow of a rock up to the heavens, and angels are ascending and descending on that ladder. And on top of that ladder, he hears the voice of the Lord saying that God promises him the promise that went to Abraham and Isaac, his father, and that God will indeed bring it to fulfillment and that the land will be theirs, the promised land, and that his people will be a blessing to everyone on the earth. What a beautiful and powerful blessing. And so it's amazing because the rock is transformed into the stairway to heaven. Now, if you're a classic rock fan, of course, you'll know that this inspired Led Zeppelin to that great classic rock tomb, Stairway to Heaven, right? So, uh, but whether you are or not, it's inspired some beautiful uh, images and paintings and stained glass because it's a, I think it's a powerful moment when we look at that. And the first thing to notice there is that it's interesting because the angels are ascending and descending, we're told. And so there's a sense in which the place where Jacob was that he thought was forlorn, 
uh, along a deserted pathway of life was really the place of God. The angels were going up and coming down. And so uh, it was also the place where he heard the affirmation of God's blessing. And so Jacob wakes up the next morning and he says, truly God was in this place and I was not aware of it. You had moments in life where God was there and you really weren't aware of it until things got really desperate. And then he says, how awesome is this place? So the stone, the pathway that's distant and forlorn in the middle of nowhere becomes, as he calls it, the house of God, literally. And so he names it Bethel. He takes the stone that he used as the pillow for his head and he turns it upright and he anoints it with oil and he says a blessing. He says, God, indeed, if you will see me along this journey of life, if you will be with me and bring me back sometime in the future to my father's house in safety, then I will serve you all my days and I will always give you a tithe, a tenth of all that I have. And so it is Bethel, the house of God. Let me ask you, what is your rock along life's way? What is your Bethel? What is the place that you thought God wasn't there where you were between a rock and a hard place and all of a sudden God gave you a new, a new vision in life, a new dream, uh, a promise that God would be there for you? I think one of the most amazing things as we look at this is that when we look at our own life, sometimes we realize that God can take our stone and turn it into a staircase, into a vision, into a dream. And so sometimes we have tried to manipulate our life and circumstances, maybe through the best motivations or maybe through the worst, but we're trying to get our own way, but we find out when we do that that we are just destitute. We're between a rock and a hard place, and we come to a place where we basically surrender. We give up. I mean, I think God had to get Jacob to the place where Jacob was willing to just say, okay, I don't know what else to do. And God was able to move into his heart and life in that moment in a brand new way. Now, I want to say this, that even though God gave Jacob this vision, this dream, this special moment and promise, it did not mean that his life would be easy. In fact, his life was going to be rather difficult in the next chapters before him. But God's promise would come true. The promise would be fulfilled. God's presence would be with him along the journey of life. And God would bring him back and even bring reconciliation. And I think in our own way, then we do find ourselves in this between a rock and a hard place. And God gives us a fresh dream and a fresh vision for life. It doesn't mean that it'll just come about easily. Sometimes it takes a lot of work. Sometimes it takes us going through hill and valley. But God has promised that God will see us through. You know, there's lots of places in Scripture other than this moment where Jacob, where people were caught between a rock and a hard place, and God came in a miraculous way. I think, first of all, of, of David when he was just a teenager. Remember that moment when uh, Saul and the armies, including David's older brothers, were lined up on the one hillside uh, facing the Philistines on the other, and the Philistines had sent out their great giant, their great warrior, to do a one-on-one -on -one battle uh, with the Israelites for their best warrior, and that would decide the battle. And everyone was afraid in Saul's camp, in Saul's army, and David comes and says, I'll face the giant. And so, uh, David was too small for the armor and too small for the sword, so he took all that he had, which was a slingshot. And he went out to the creek and took uh, the stones there and put a stone in the slingshot, and before him was Goliath the giant. David literally was, again, between a rock and a hard place, and he had to trust God. But in that moment, God miraculously was there, and David was able to slay the giant. And I think in our own life, if we're willing to do what we can, if we're willing when we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place to do probably the only thing that's left, which is just to trust God, we'll find that God will show up. I remember a, a friend of mine saying that, he says, you know, you really haven't lived until you've been to that place in life where if God doesn't show up, everything's lost. Now, that's not something that I would wish on anyone, but haven't you had a moment or two in life where if God didn't show up, everything's lost? And I think the good news of this scripture for all of us is when we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place, know that oftentimes that's the moment that God is waiting so that we surrender and faith and trust to God and God will show up with a staircase to heaven. God will show up with a, a new vision, a new dream, a new promise assuring us that he'll see us through. 
true story that I love that's modern day is the story of Anne Lamott. I don't know if you're a fan of Anne Lamott, the author, but she recounts in uh, the story about herself where she was a point in her life where she was very close to her father and lost her father early in life in her early 20s. And so uh, it sent her into this spiral of depression and abusing drugs and alcohol. And she became addicted and she really just felt like her life was so hopeless that she even contemplated suicide. And she recalls one night in bed when all the lights were out and the room was dark that she became aware of this presence in the room with her in the corner. And after a while, she began to feel that that presence was Jesus. And so she yelled into the corner at this presence, get out of here. I don't want anything to do with you. And she began to think of what her friends would say uh, if they knew that she had some kind of religious experience or was a follower of Christ. So she became aware that after a while, the presence was gone. But as she began to live through the next days and weeks ahead, she began to see little God moments in her life. She saw God kind of in the sunrise and in the sunset, and she saw God in the smile of a baby, and she swears she even saw God driving a yellow pinto that stopped for her to carry her groceries across the street. And she says at one point, she just finally was at wit's end, literally between a rock and a hard place, and she said, okay, Jesus, I'm yours. And in that moment, the Lord touched her heart and life in a life-changing moment where her addiction for drugs and alcohol was gone. She still had struggles ahead of her, and there was a new faith, a new life, a new promise, a new dream in her life. And so her life began to change in amazing ways. And so uh, she decided she was going to go to church on Sunday morning, so she picked a small church. She wasn't sure how the church would accept her. She didn't look like they did, she knew, and she walked in and she found that even they were a small group of believers, they were very warm and welcoming to her. And so they began to bless her. They encouraged her along the way and she found a little Bible study and that group of Christians celebrated her first year of recovery. And then down the road, they celebrated the birth of her, her baby and her faith began to grow. And of course, she uh, not only has a great ministry today, but she's worked, uh, written a number of books that have influenced countless people's lives. But it, that turning point was a moment in her life where she thought it was the darkest, bleakest, hardest moment of her life, the rock and the hard place. I think God is still taking stones and making them into staircase. And so this morning, if you feel like you are on the road of life and you don't know where you're going, you feel lost, you've struggled, tried to make things your own way, and you have nothing to do but to lay your weary head on a stone for a pillow, take heart. God can often take the stone and turn it into a staircase, even as he did with Jacob, even as he did with Anne Lamott, even as he did with young David. So I encourage us, as we are this morning along the journey of life, to be encouraged by that word. And if you know someone who's laying their head on a pillow of a rock this morning, whatever it is, then give them a word of encouragement. God does indeed meet us along the road of life. And many times when we are stuck between a rock and a hard place. God shows up with a stairway to heaven. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, this morning we think about Jacob in this turning point in his life where he was destitute. He was on the way to a place that he didn't really even know of, and behind him lay the things that meant the most. But you met him along the road of life as he lay his head on a rock, as he was caught between a rock and a hard place, you turned the stone into a staircase to heaven. You gave him a fresh vision, a fresh dream, and you gave him a promise. So we pray you'll do the same in our lives, knowing that you are faithful. We pray this in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen. This song I played last year, and I had several requests to play it again. So... Here it is, it's 17 hymns, parts of hymns, uh, in about two minutes. So those of you worshiping online have an advantage. If you don't want to listen, you can hit the mute button.
Beautiful. Thank you, Stephen. As we go before the Lord in prayer, I know there's a lot of needs on our hearts and minds this morning. I'd just like to lift up that a great saint of this church, Rowena Dickerson, passed away this week, and we want to lift up Dottie and the family in prayer and also give thanks for Rowena's life. She did so many things around this uh, church, so uh, we will share news of her services whenever uh, we put those together. But uh, please join me in praying for her as well as others. And I know we also, in the midst of all of our struggles, have a lot to give thanks for. So let's take a few moments in silent prayer and then go before the Lord in prayer. We thank you that today is the Lord's day, your day, and we are in your house. Whether we are here in worship or online, the whole world is your cathedral. So whether we feel like we're in a place of bounty or feel like we're laying against a rock, we know that you are here to meet us and to be with us along life's journey. We surrender all of our cares to you today. And with thanks, we look around at amazement and awe and wonder at the beauty of creation. Even now, we see a new comet that in the evening hours is lighting up the night sky. It won't return for another 6,800 years so we get to see that special blessing right now. Help us to treasure these moments. We know that in those small wonders, often we can find the staircase to your blessings, even in, as in the big moments of life. Thank you for the blessings of creation and for country and community, family and friends, but most of all, in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who came to share our lives with us and to show us the way of life and love. Lay down his life on Calvary that we would know your love and forgiveness and grace. And was raised to new life that we would have the promise of a new life in this life and in eternal life to come. Help us to open our hearts and lives to your love and grace today and each and every day. But also help us to share the good news of your love with those near and far. Lord, we lift up those who are down and discouraged today. We think of those who've lost loved ones, and we especially lift up the Dickerson family this morning. But there's so many others who've lost loved ones, and it's even more difficult during a time such as this with a pandemic when we can't honor those with the traditional services that we like. But we know that you are here in the presence in our life with us. We also lift up those who are sick today, whether at home or hospital or a nursing home. We pray, Lord, that you lead and guide and bless the medical staff who are caring for them. But we also pray that you, our Lord and great physician, would touch and strengthen them in body, mind, and spirit. We lift up those, Lord, who need not only healing touch in their body, but also in relationships and pray that you bless them today. We pray for those who need direction in life, that you guide them along the way of life. We pray that you bless all of our missions and ministries as we strive to make a difference in our world, whether here in our church or in our community or around the world. We pray all the, for all the kids and all the families who've taken part in our vacation Bible school and sports camp that they would continue to feel the blessing of that ministry. We pray for every person that's here in worship this morning or worshiping online. Help us to all feel a fresh touch of your spirit. We pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Go forth for the blessing of Almighty God, the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, and the peace and power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. God bless you, and have a great week. Mm -hmm.